Hey, if you have your Bibles open, would you please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's towards Revelation. If you get to Timothy, go left. If you, if you get to like Colossians or Ephesians, one of those, go right. Uh, it's a small book, and so it might take some time to, to find it. If you have a device, you should be able to get to it fairly quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, our scripture reading this morning is beginning at verse 13 to the end of the chapter. And so out of respect for reading God's word, if you're willing and able, would you please stand? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. The Apostle Paul writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the hope that they give us. We thank you for what it costs you to give us that hope. And so, Lord, we're going to look at this passage today, and we're going to bury our minds and our hearts in it. But right now, our hearts also go to many people in Orlando that are suffering incredible loss. Father, we, 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 we can't even imagine the grief that is over sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, because of this violent act. And so, Father, we pray for the churches in Orlando that they will rise up with the grace and love of Christ and embrace those who grieve without hope, that they may receive the hope of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, that the church in Florida, will be the church in everything that you would want it to be. And Father, in the meantime, we, we get into this passage and we go into what the gospel changes and how it changes our tomorrow. We thank you that you are God. We thank you that you have forgiven the preacher of his sins, for there are many. In the holy name of Christ, all God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to begin with putting a spring in your step, and no doubt it will, by telling you that in your future, there is a lot of death. Aren't you just, you know, puppies and unicorns kind of thing? You know, I mean, it's just great. Thank you, Craig, for putting a spring in my step. No matter who you are, in your future, there is a lot of death. That became a reality for me personally at the ripe old age of seven. I was seven years old, and I heard that one of my aunts had died. I'd never met her. Her name was May. I just heard folks talk about her. I didn't, I didn't know who she was. She was very, very old, and that I was going to be going to her funeral. I'd never been to a funeral before. And at that funeral, that, is so, that was 50 years ago, that is so etched in my mind, I can almost remember everything that went on. I can remember the people who were there, the people I was sitting beside. I can remember everything because on that day, I saw two things I had never seen in my young life. Number one, I'd never seen a dead body. Up to that point, I was raised in the country, seen all kinds of dead bodies, just never seen a dead human. And at that time, the custom was, and it's still kind of the custom, not as much anymore, the custom was that there would be an open casket service, and at the end of the service, all the people would file by, and I don't know why, but they would pay their respects or confirm that the person is indeed dead. And I never, I can remember thinking that, I wonder why we're doing this. But I filed by with my mom and my dad at seven years old, looked at Aunt May, didn't know who she was, but I'd never seen a dead body, and I can still, I can still see her in my mind's eye. That was the first thing I'd never seen before until then was a dead human body. The second thing I'd never experienced before, I'd never seen before, is I had never seen an adult cry. 
And at this funeral, apparently, Aunt May was this wonderful woman, and all kinds of adults were weeping and crying at her funeral. My mom, my dad, my aunts, my uncles, my older cousins. And this, this was etched in my mind, and the reason why it's still in my mind today is because on that day, I began to do the math. And I've told you before, I think, and if so, then just let me say it again. I'm the youngest one in my clan, not just my immediate family, but I'm the youngest one counting aunts and uncles on my mom's side and on my dad's side. We, together, we have a family of about 100 people. I'm the baby of everybody. The only thing that I'm older than was whatever current pet we happened to have at the time. And I can remember sitting there listening to the preacher say really great things about Jesus and Aunt May, seeing the dead body, seeing all kinds of people that I love around me crying, and I can remember doing the math, saying to myself, if I live to be as old as Aunt May, I will see every single person in this room die. I will go to their funeral. And I thought that as a seven-year-old, it was before video games. As a seven-year-old, I, re- I, 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 I internalize that. As a, I'm going to see everybody in this room die. And at that time, I had no idea I was going to be a pastor. But because I'm the family pastor, I get to be the one that officiates at all of those funerals now. And that was when I became aware that there's a lot of death in my future. And then not even thinking about my own. There's a lot of death in my future. The beautiful thing about what we're going to be talking about today is the gospel gives us a way to understand that and to be impacted by the reality of death. This is the last message in our series, The Gospel Changes Everything. I, I, along with the other pastoral staff, we really hope that you've been blessed by what you've heard. What we've tried to do is is take the gospel in theory and, get, and put it into real time, into real life situations. Uh, you heard from Jim Culp last Sunday, one of our missionaries to Mexico, and he talked about today how the gospel changes our present. Before that, I talked about how the gospel changes our past. Well, now, today, I want to talk about how the gospel changes our future, and the future that, that holds over us, the future that controls us, is the reality and the presence of death. It may not be exactly what you would think it to be, but I'm hoping that it can bring some encouragement to you because no matter who you are, even if you're not a Christian, you have a view of death. In fact, I've listed a few of them there for you just to have an idea, and it's under number one if you're taking notes. The the thing that the gospel does, it gives us permission to fearlessly hate death. You and I as Christians, we don't have to accept death. We can fearlessly hate it for what it is, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But even if you're not a Christian, no doubt you have a point of view of death. It may not be something you want to talk about. It may not be something you want to face. But whether you like it or not, or whether I like it or not, there is a lot of death in your future that will culminate in your own unless Jesus comes back soon. And so what are those approaches? Well, there's the the traditional Christian approach approach. And this is the approach I've seen a lot. I, I've, I, I told the early service and, and a couple people didn't believe me. I've done probably four to five hundred funerals in a career of four decades. When we were in Corning up north, uh, we were there for ten years. I would do probably 50 to 60 funerals a year there just because I was, I was the town pastor, so to speak. And, and so I, 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 I've been around a lot of dead people. I've been around a lot of grieving people. And there is this traditional Christian approach that goes something like this. If, 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 if there is a funeral, in fact, there's going to be one today at Stan Adair, who's a long-standing member of our Cape Church. But all kinds of things, that, you know, this Christian approach where, where we have to be subdued or we have to put on this joyful face or we have to act happy or we have tears, but we have to act very stoic and, and reserved. And if we see anybody really just losing it, losing their grief and losing their tears and, and weeping and wailing and crying out loud, sometimes there's something in our mind, and hopefully we have enough class that we would never say this out loud, but we think it, we think, well, that person must not have a lot of faith because obviously they, they're, they're grieving, they're, 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 
they're crying out loud, they're weeping and, and just having a very difficult time. I want to I contest that a little bit today, but that's a traditional Christian approach is keep a stiff upper lip, keep composed, and if you can't keep, keep composed, then, then act like you're joyful because after all, you know, Jesus took care of all that. But then there's a secular approach, and this one is that death is the end, that's it, accept it. There's no point in grieving about it. You die, you're done. And so move on. Live as if there's no tomorrow. Party as if there's no tomorrow because, you know, all you got is today. And that's a very typical secular approach. Then there's a contemporary approach that's very popular today as well. And this may be the impetus behind the Assisted Suicide Act that Megan Farrow wrote about in the e-blast this last Friday. If you have not read that, you need to. It's, very, it's great writing, great thinking. I'm very grateful for her to put those words down. The contemporary approach is this. Hey, listen, death is natural. <clears throat> death is a natural part of life. It just is. It's just, it's just natural. It's, it's kind of like the, the Lion King kind of thing. It, you know, when you die, you go into the ground, you become fertilizer, grass grows up, animals come in and eat the grass, and then other animals come in and eat those animals. It's a circle of life. Be encouraged. When you die, you become fertilizer. And somehow we're supposed to be glad about that as Elton John sings in the background. Well, I think that there's a gospel perspective to death. In fact, we see it kind of in capsulized ways in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Paul is writing to a group of Christians in, in a town called Thessalonica, and he's writing to them because they have a problem. It's not necessarily a problem, it's a question. And the question is, Paul, what happens when a Christian dies? Because they were under the assumption that when Jesus said, I'm coming soon, that he's coming soon. Like within the few months, or maybe a year or two. And, and that was the assumption. And so they lived under this, this anticipation that Jesus could come any day and so be ready. But the problem was all of these godly Christians were dying of disease or old age and they had a question, wait a minute, if, because the gospel doesn't seem to address death except the death of Christ. But what about my dad's death? What about my son's death? What about my Aunt May's death? What, what about those deaths, Paul? And so Paul writes 1 Thessalonians to address that issue with them. And so he says this, he says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, but about those who are asleep, that's a euphemism for those who die, that you may not grieve as others, who, others do who have no hope. Do you see the, the double negative there? He says, go ahead and grieve. Just don't do it like those who have no hope. There is a kind of grief that you're going to have, and, and what I want you to do with that grief is I want you to rub hope into it. Rub hope into that grief because that is what will make a reality of the grief. Now think about this. In, in John 11, John 11, Jesus is going to Bethany. It's a place where his friends Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, live. Jesus gets word that Lazarus is dead. And so he goes, what we think, if we've never read the story, we think he's going to console Mary and Martha and, and, and mourn with them. We had the story going, and John records this. Jesus is going to Bethany, and he meets up with Mary first, and John makes this observation. Jesus wept. He cried. He, did, he doesn't really say anything. He just weeps and cries with Mary. Now, if you know the story, you know what's going to happen. Jesus knows what's going to happen, and he's still crying. But then he gets to the tomb where Lazarus is laid, and, and John makes this observation of Jesus. And this is what he says. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. That, that is an understatement for what the Greek means. The English translation does not do justice to the Greek translation. The Greek translation literally means this. Jesus shook with rage. 
Jesus shook with rage. He was shaking. He was angry. John is saying, he's watching Jesus, and he's saying, oh my goodness, he's going to erupt. He was physically overwhelmed with anger and rage. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why is he quaking? Why is he shaking with anger? Why is he weeping? He knows that he's going to say, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus will. So why is Jesus expending the emotional energy to rage, to weep? Because he sees death for what it is. It's an intruder. He sees death for what it is. It was never meant to be that way. We were never meant to stop breathing. We were meant to always breathe. We were never meant to weaken. We were meant to strengthen. We were never meant to lie down forever. We were meant to run forever and walk forever and eat forever. But because we decided to be our own saviors, our own messiahs, we decided to take our life and say, God, we can do better with our life than you can. The unintended consequence of that was death. And Jesus sees death for what it is. It's an intruder. This is not the way it was meant to be. This was not to be part of my kingdom. And here it is. And I hate it. I hate it. That's why I think Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, you know what? Jesus didn't take a stoic approach. Jesus didn't take a traditional Christian approach. Have the tears, but be joyful because he knew what he was going to do with Lazarus. No, Jesus took the approach, I hate this. I hate death. I am so angry at death because it has come into a world where it is not welcome. And my friend has succumbed to that. I, I, I think that we have freedom to fearlessly hate fearlessly despise death. That when we grieve, we grieve, we cry, we weep, we wail. We're overwhelmed by it, but we're never overcome by it. Because Paul says, I want you to take that grief, that reality, it's right in your face. That loved one will not be with you for a while. That death has done something to your loved one's body that should never have been done. Hate that. But don't be afraid of it. Rub hope into it. Rub hope. We'll talk about that hope in a minute. That's number one, permission to fearlessly hate death. Number two, the promise of boundless love. You know, Paul seems to, he spends some time comparing the Christian perspective of the gospel to other perspectives. He says, I want you to grieve, but not like those who have hope, who don't have hope. He's comparing He recognizes that almost all belief systems have some form of life after death. Very few belief systems, if they're popular at all, very few belief systems, very few religions have any promise of when you die, you're done. But rather, they have life after death. But most of them, especially the Eastern ones, ones, they they have this idea that, that you become a life force, you become an energy, you become a disembodied individual, and you are a drop that goes into the ocean. And once you go into the ocean, you're no longer a drop, you're just part of the ocean. And you're just a life force. Star Wars kind of thing. You become Obi Wan Kenobi, you become Jedi, you become you become that. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying, actually, the life after death that the gospel promotes is a physical life after death. It's not a spiritual thing where we kind of float, and like the old commercials, you just kind of float, and you find a cloud and learn how to play harp, and you hover there forever. You you, you don't do that. There is this physical aspect to life after death. Look what he says, for example, in uh, verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. There is this promise. God is going to bring with Jesus those who have died. My mom, my niece, my grandparents, my father-in-law. With Jesus, when he comes, will be those people who have preceded me in death and you in death. These are physical beings, 
physical people. And the reason why we can say they're physical is because of what Paul says in verse 14, the very first part of that. For since we believe that Jesus died physically and rose physically again, even so through Jesus, the same thing's going to happen to those who are in Jesus. No, I know for many of you that's kind of Dick and Jane theology. It's very basic. But brothers and sisters, what we're going to try and find out is how does that affect today? How does that reality meet us in real time where we are today with bills that need to be paid, jobs that we want to have or jobs that we don't have that we have, relationships? How does that play a part? We'll talk about that in a moment. And so we get this idea and get this get this. Um, and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who fall. We're going to be together. We're, going to, we're not going to be a drop in the ocean where we stop being a drop. We're going to be a drop in God's family, and we're going to continue to be a drop because, like the song says, he calls us not drops in the ocean. He calls us sons and daughters. And we will be gathered together with other sons and daughters as individuals. You will maintain that individuality. You will be the person you are, only perfect. You will be everything that you ever wanted to be. And more. Why? Because Jesus died and Jesus rose. And the same thing's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to all who are in Christ. But then not only do we get each other. Not only will I see my niece and my, my mom and my father-in-law and my grandparents and, and so many other godly men and women that I've buried in the past, I'm going to see them again. Not only that, but I'm going to see Jesus. Look at verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. You see what Paul does? He says, yeah, oh, it's going to be a crowd. There's going to be multitudes of people, but the spotlight will be on one person. He, he, Paul doesn't say, we get to be with everybody. We get to be with everybody. It's going to be awesome. Everybody's going to be there. Well, well, Paul says, yeah, everybody's going to be there. You're not going to notice them because Jesus will be there, and we get to be with him. The beautiful thing that Paul's talking about here is that we're looking forward to not is just the coming of the Lord or the appearing of the Lord, but the getting of the Lord. We get him. We get all that he is. We see him physically. We embrace him physically. We relate to him physically. On Sundays as we gather together, we sing about him. We sing to him. We, we want to make him much. We want to, to talk about how beautiful he is, how powerful he is, how wonderful he is. But we also know that he is not here like he will be on that day when he really is here. And we get him. We get him. I look forward to that day. So permission to fearlessly hate death, the promise of boundless love, and then three, our enemy is truly defeated. That's the gospel perspective of death is our enemy is truly defeated. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. I, I receive tremendous hope from that passage, but I think we also need to rethink the passage. And this is the part where you may want to get your torches and pitchforks and kick me out of town. Because I want to challenge the conventional belief that probably Arcade has had, that certainly I was raised with. I want to challenge that. Because look at what Paul says. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. This last part of verse 17. The question begs to be asked, well then once we meet him, where do we go? Paul doesn't say. He, he says, you're going to meet the Lord in the air. So where do we go? I don't know about you, but I was taught, I was taught that, that that's going to be God's massive relocation plan, is that when we meet the Lord in the air, we're going to be taken away someplace else. We're going to be relocated to some other place, 
and there we will set up eternity and live in this, this heaven, this new earth. That we're going to live there and, and do that. I want to challenge that thought. I'm not going to challenge the idea of the rapture. I believe in the rapture. I believe that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air with those who have preceded us in death. I really do believe that. How it's going to work, I don't know. Frankly, I don't care. I just know it's going to be happening. But what happens after that, I think, is very significant. And it comes from the word meet. If you look at that in verse 17, the word meet. I want to challenge that conventional thinking in many of our churches and certainly the way I was raised with this. The word meet there is a technical term. It's a technical term to denote I'm going to go out and meet someone and enter, re-enter with them. I'm going out to meet you. If, for example, if you're coming to my house and you're lost, I'm going to go out someplace in Carmichael and find you. I'm going to go out and then bring you with me. I'm going to meet you and bring you with me. That's the technical meaning of the word meet. Think of it this way. We live in a kingdom and we find out that another country is invading our land our king, with his army, goes out and engages the invaders in battle, and our king wins. We get the messenger back that our king has won, and we are so excited. And finally, we find out that our king is like 10 miles away coming into the city. A bunch of us are going to go out and meet the king and come into the city with him. We're going to come in because we want to be part of the celebration. We want to walk with our victorious king. We want to be with him. We want to go out and meet him and come back into the city and be part of the party and part of the celebration. That is what Paul is talking about. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, yes, we're going to meet the Lord in the air, and then guess what? We're coming back. We're coming back because the king is victorious. We're going to come back, and for once and for all, sin and death are done. And our king is reclaiming his creation. This is his. It is not death. It is not sins. It is not Satan. It is Christ and Christ alone. He is the creator, and he's coming back, and we are going to meet him somewhere out there and come in with him. I think it's pretty good news. We're not going someplace else. We're not relocating to some other fourth dimension. We're not going to become the force. We're going to come back to this physical earth that God physically created, that we physically screwed up, and he's going to reclaim it for his own. Now think about this. For those of you who think, I don't know, Craig, that sounds awful liberal to me. Think about this. How is it a victory? How is it a victory if Jesus comes, takes us away, and we go someplace else. We turn our back on this creation that God has made. We turn our back on this world. We turn our back on the beauty of it. We turn our back on everything, and we go someplace else. How is that a victory? How is it a victory, for example, in the Vietnam War? When we evacuated, we got all of our troops out of Vietnam, and all of the people that we fought for 10 years to keep out of Vietnam, they came right in after us. Was that a victory? How about ask the Russians how they feel about Afghanistan when they left Afghanistan. Had they had a victory? No, they left land that they were trying to overtake and they lost. So how is it a victory if our king comes, takes us out of a land he created without first of all declaring that this land is his? And he defeats all of his enemies. And the enemies that have reigned on this earth are death and sin and Satan. And Jesus, our king, is coming to take care of once and for all of all those things because he died and he rose. And guess what he's bringing with him? He's bringing people who have risen with him as well. And when we hear, I don't know how it's going to look, but when we hear that our king is coming, somehow we are caught up with him and we are going to be marching back onto this place right now where he will set up victory. This is his. It's not Satan's. It's not death's. It's not sin's. It is Christ and Christ alone. And he is coming to set up this place the way it was meant to be. That's why in the Bible, the Bible begins in a garden and the commission there by the creator 
is to give to the man and the woman, to us. He says, now go and, and go do something constructive with it. Go and steward it. Go and manage it. In other words, he's saying go and, and build and create and populate and grow and, and do wonderful things with this creation that I've done. Manage it. Sin messed that up. But the Bible begins with a garden, and it ends in a city. And what's at the middle of the city? The tree of life. The tree that was in the garden. This is heaven. This is why we are called to love this place, to steward this place, to see injustice. This is why, because of the certainty of the fact that our king is coming here and he is going to set up his kingdom here. And so the Grand Canyon will be there. It'll be beautiful. Mount Everest will be there. It'll be awesome. Mount Rushmore, maybe not. But it'll all be, it'll be incredible. It will be everything that God said it was meant to to be, and so will you, and so will I. We will be what we were intended to be. And so Paul is saying, when we meet the Lord in the air, we're meeting him to come back in with him. Now I know that that messes with some of your eschatology charts. My suggestion to you is throw away the chart. And just see the word for what it means. It's a beautiful picture that God has given us. And I love it. The Bible doesn't say, hey, hey, don't fear death because it's natural. The Bible says don't fear death because it's been defeated. It's been beaten. And Jesus, our Lord, beat it. And so will you and so will I. So how do we get that? We get a life of certainty. We get that certainty today. Look at, for example, look at verse 13 again. The whole passage is around this one verse, really. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. There are people that have no hope. And then he says at the end of the chapter, verse 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. Yeah, encourage one another with these words. What's he mean? Because we have hope. What's the hope? The hope is Christ. Look at chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 9, the very first part. For God has not destined us for wrath. The reason why you and I can rub hope into our very real grief, we can rub hope into our very real loss, we can rub hope into that and grieve when death occurs, but we need not fear. The only reason why we can is because God's wrath is not for all those who are in Christ. Why? Why? Why, isn't, why is it that I can have hope about my in, imminent death and the death of my loved ones? Why is it that I can have hope about that and not grieve about that? Paul says, because you're not under wrath. Well, why am I not under wrath? Look at the rest of verse 9. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. You see, a, a, a while back I shared with you that every single command in the New Testament, every single command in the New Testament always has very, very close in proximity to it the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here Paul is giving us a command. He's saying, when you die or when someone dies, grieve, but don't grieve like the people who have no hope because you have hope. And the hope is this, you are not destined for wrath. It's past tense. It's not, perhaps you will not have wrath. It's, no, you don't have any wrath. You want to know why there's no wrath upon you? There's no wrath upon you. It's because Jesus took the wrath. He took the wrath from you. The poison of death, the sting of death is sin, and Jesus took the poison. Jesus took it all. And so now, all of this wrath that, is, that God has for this world, it is not for us because Jesus Christ took the wrath. That's where the hope is founded. Our hope is not in our ability to measure up. 
Our hope is not based upon how often we attend church or how well we ingest the Bible or how much we give. Our hope is rock solid on the foundation that Jesus Christ took all of the wrath that was for us. And now there is no more wrath. No more wrath for all who are in Christ. Because Jesus became the bullseye of that. My favorite story, and I've, I've told it dozens of times, I don't think I've told it here. It's of a pastor in Philadelphia. His name was Donald Gray Barnhouse. And he was in, a Presbyterian pastor in Philadelphia for many, many years. And he's now with the Lord. And uh, his wife passed away when his four children were very, very young. She passed away with natural causes. And they were coming back from her funeral service, and his youngest son was having a very, very difficult time with the loss of his mom. You can imagine, or maybe you can't. And he was just weeping, and just overwhelmed by the reality, and he began to fear death. He wanted to know where mommy was, and, and is she okay, and what's going on, and all that kind of stuff. And, and they happened to be, they were in his car, and Barnhouse happened to be passing a semi on the freeway, on the highway, as they were going home from the funeral. And he got the idea. He asked his young, youngest son, he says, let me tell you, uh, do you see that truck? Yeah. Do you see the shadow that the truck is casting? Yes. Yes, Dad, I see the shadow. Would you rather be hit by the shadow or hit by the truck? And the, the child responded with the obvious answer, I'd rather be hit by the shadow. He says, because of Jesus... Your mom was hit by the shadow because Jesus was hit by the truck. That's why we can be able to have hope. In John chapter 8, Jesus makes this very bold statement. It's one of the statements that probably got him killed. Anyone who believes in me, anyone who believes in me will not see death. That's not me paraphrasing. That's what he is saying. Anyone who believes in me will not see death. And so when your heart stops pumping, when your brain waves stop waving, when all of a sudden you die physically, death comes for you. Death comes for you, and right before death comes to you, Jesus steps in the way and says, Nuh-uh. You don't get him. You don't get her. She's mine. She will not see you, death, because I saw you. I killed you. Get the hell out of here. I don't know if Jesus says that exactly. <laughs> but pretty close. That is the certainty that we have. So how does, that, how does that matter to us? Jason, you guys can come on up right now. How does that, how does that matter to us in real time? What, do, what, what is the significance of that right now? And I've got some suggestions for you that I think are pretty good. It means that we fight. That might surprise you a little bit. We don't fight like everybody else fights. We fight the things that Jesus fought. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was very physical. The presence of Jesus Christ on this planet was very physical. The coming of Jesus to, again to this place is very physical. Your death will be physical. My death will be physical. And so will your resurrection and my resurrection. We're not ghosts. Our bodies will come back because Jesus came back. And since much of our life is physical, we have been given marching orders on this planet, and our marching orders do not necessarily just include gathering for Sunday services. But rather, we have been put here to fight the same things that Jesus fought. He fought injustice. He fought exploitation. He fought abuse. He fought phony religion. He fought... He fought legalistic religion. Anything, even if it's called Christian, if it diminishes the grace of God, Jesus would fight that. And so we have been put here to look in our world and see where, where are people being marginalized? Where are they being abused? Where are they being exploited? Where are people being forgotten? Where are people not seen? We are for them because Jesus would have been for them. 
We want to get people saved. We want them to believe in Jesus. We want them to embrace the gospel. And the way that we can be able to do that is by being Christ to them. That's why our mission statement, again, is to get as many people as possible to hear and see Jesus by gathering with Jesus in mind on Sundays and scattering with Jesus in view Monday through Saturday. Make him viewable to people. Allow them to see And sometimes that means that we fight, not the things that we think are against us all the time, but we fight those things that seem to abuse and exploit people. Abortion is murdering innocent babies. We fight that. At the same time, loving the young mother who's in the dilemma of what to do. We fight those things. We fight. We're active in fighting for those things simply because those are the things that Jesus would fight if he were here physically. It also means that we're joyful. I know we use that word on Sundays a lot, but let's face it, most of your life is not not one where you'd put the banner of joy over every day. You've got stresses, you've got problems, you've got relational issues, marriage issues, child raising issues, physical problems. We all face those things, but because Jesus Christ has secured our tomorrow. There is this semblance of joy that we can be able to experience in real time. And let's face it, and this is, I'm going to meddle here a little bit, and and so please understand, I do this because I love you. But when it comes to this political season, I think sometimes the best thing for us to do is just just shut up. I I don't want to hear what another Christian thinks about Trump or Hillary or Bernie or whatever. I don't. Uh, Jesus is going to be my right in. That should be a hashtag. Jesus is my right in. But I, this is our chance. There, there are people in this world, in our country, who are afraid. And what I find ironic is that the people who are afraid the most are the people who have been given the assurance the most. Christians. And so I, I, I think there has to be a point where someone needs to say, calm down. If you think this world is getting worse, then that means you've read your Bible. And so we stand, and we speak, we vote, we, we advocate, we, we, we talk about ideas, but this fear, this fear is overwhelming, and it sucks our joy away. No one is going to want Jesus if all they hear is how much we hate whatever candidate we hate. No one is going to want to embrace Jesus if all they see in you is panic. And so we as the people of God, we can be involved politically, we can be involved in a political conversation as much as we want, but when it comes to a point where we are dispelling fear and panic, and oh, if this person wins, then this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. You don't know that. Nobody does. Everybody thinks they have information nobody else has. The information that we have is that Jesus Christ is king. He is our king, and we live for him, and there will be a day, whether we're alive or dead, when he's going to come back. And he's going to take everything that's wrong in this world and make it right. And you and I will be part of that party, which is my third point. My third one is this. It means we find ways to party. I know for some of you, you might think, well, party is such a worldly word. We need to take it back. What I mean by party, I mean party. I mean, we find ways, we look for excuses, we look for reasons, we look for opportunities to truly party because we worship this great God. We're not sticking our heads in the sand or crying that the sky is falling. We are facing reality. We know what is real, and reality is that Jesus is Lord and no one else. This is his world, and we are part of his kingdom because of his death, burial, and resurrection. And because that matters to us, all of a sudden, yesterday matters, today matters, and tomorrow matters. It all matters because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is king, and that gives us pause to stop and ask this question. How are we going to party? How are we going to celebrate this? How are we going to love this in such a way? You've heard the phrase, party like there's no tomorrow? 
We as believers, we party because of tomorrow. Because our God is God of tomorrow. And that matters for us today, I think. I'm looking for an amen. Is, can I get an amen? Thank you, thank you. Praise teams with me. There. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Thanks. So listen. We have got to learn how to party. And the reason why we got to learn how to party is not because we're not facing reality. We're, we need to learn how to party because we are facing reality. We know what the truth is, and the truth is there's a lot of death in our future. And we have a Lord that killed death. And so we're not afraid of death, not because it's natural. We're not afraid of death because it's lost, it's defeated, it's done. Put a fork in it, it's over. And so all the death that we have in our future, there is victory, there is joy, there is party. And so we find ways to do that. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church Podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. 